a fighter jet so advanced that it unsettled even the engineers who created it, fast enough to outrun nearly anything in the sky, stealthy enough to fade from enemy radar like a phantom. The YF-23 Black Widow II was designed to dominate the skies for generations. Instead, it was sidelined, placed inside a museum, and buried by a single decision that continues to trouble Pentagon. Leadership even decades later. But here is the truth most people missed. This forgotten warplane has delivered a warning the U.S. Air Force can no longer ignore. And what it reveals about America's future in aerial warfare is deeply unsettling. The year was 1991. On the runway at Edwards Air Force Base, two radically different aircraft sat poised to determine the future of American air dominance. One would go on to become the legendary F-22 Raptor. The other would quietly vanish from public memory. Yet the aircraft that lost that competition may have been the superior fighter all along. And today, as China and Russia rapidly close the technological gap with their own stealth aircraft, that long-forgotten decision is resurfacing with serious consequences. Welcome to Nuke Aviator. This is the story of one of the most controversial choices in U.S. Air Force history and why the ghost of the YF-23 is once again haunting Washington. If you believe, America should always field the best possible fighter technology. You already understand why this story matters. In the late 1980s, the global balance of air power was shifting. The Soviet Union was rolling out advanced fighters like the MiG-29 and Su-27. These were not upgraded, Cold War relics. They were legitimate, modern threats capable of challenging American, Air superiority for the first time in decades, the Pentagon recognized the danger immediately. It did not need an incremental improvement. It needed an overwhelming response. That response became the advanced tactical fighter. Program.2 Aerospace Powerhouses answered the call. Lockheed joined forces with Boeing and General Dynamics to develop what became the YF-22. Northrop partnered with McDonnell Douglas to create the YF-23 DOT, each team invested close to $700 million. These were not experimental curiosities. They were billion-dollar bets on the future of aerial warfare. When the YF-23 emerged from Northrop Skunk Works, it looked nothing like a traditional fighter. Its diamond-shaped wings, sharply angled VT, and deeply buried engine exhausts gave it an unmistakably alien appearance. Every surface was sculpted with a single priority in mind. Remaining unseen, infrared emissions were suppressed. Radar reflections were minimized. Aerodynamic drag was reduced without compromising speed. When veteran test pilots first saw it roll onto the tarmac, many were stunned. This was not merely stealthy. It looked like technology from decades in the future. The aircraft was built around a radically different combat philosophy. Instead of close-range dogfighting, the YF-23 was designed to strike first. From long distances, without ever being detected, it could supercruise at Mach 1.6 without afterburners. That meant sustained supersonic flight with lower fuel consumption and a dramatically reduced infrared signature. The performance numbers were extraordinary. A combat radius of over 2,200 miles, nearly 500 miles greater than its competitor. A radar cross-section reportedly smaller than a steel marble. A top speed exceeding Mach 2.2 and during the evaluation trials. The YF-23 demonstrated true supercruise capability. The YF-22 did not achieve the same performance during testing. The outcome appeared obvious. Before moving further, it is important to understand that speed and stealth were only part of the equation. The YF-23 was engineered from the beginning to operate deep inside, heavily defended, airspace. Its extended range meant it could penetrate enemy territory, engage targets, and return without tanker support. For carrier-based operations, this capability was transformative. Aircraft carriers could remain farther from hostile coastlines. While still projecting power deep inland dot, the Air Force had established strict performance requirements for the advanced tactical fighter. The YF-23 met or exceeded nearly all of them. It was faster, stealthier, more fuel-efficient, longer dash-ranged. So why did it lose? The decision that changed everything came on April 23, 1991. That morning, the Secretary of the Air Force, Donald Rice, stepped before reporters and made the announcement that would shape American air power for decades. 
Why F-22 had been selected as the United States Air Force's next air superiority fighter inside Northrop's program offices. Disbelief set in almost immediately. Engineers who had spent years refining what many believed was the superior aircraft struggled to understand the outcome. Test pilots who had flown both fighters were equally confused. Defense analysts across Washington quietly questioned how the faster, stealthier jet had lost. The official explanation centered on maneuverability. The YF-22 featured thrust vectoring nozzles that could redirect engine exhaust mid- This allowed the aircraft to perform dramatic high-angle maneuvers that appeared to defy physics. In a close-range dogfight, the YF-22 could point its nose in directions other fighters could not. At air shows, the aircraft looked unbeatable, but what was rarely mentioned publicly was that the YF-23 did not need thrust vectoring to achieve comparable agility. Its massive V-tail surfaces and unconventional aerodynamics produced nearly identical turning performance through design rather than mechanical complexity, test pilot Paul Metz one of the few aviators to fly both aircraft extensively, later acknowledged that the YF-23's maneuverability had been widely underestimated. In practical terms, the difference was far smaller than the public narrative suggested. So if raw performance was not the deciding factor, what was? The answer lies at the intersection of politics, corporate reputation, timing, and a powerful internal culture within the Air Force itself. Northrop was facing serious problems. Just months before the YF-23's first flight, the company pleaded guilty to dozens of fraud charges related to previous defense programs. At the same time, its B-2 Spirit Bomber project was suffering massive cost overruns, eroding confidence on Capitol Hill and within the Pentagon. Lockheed, by contrast, was struggling financially. Winning the advanced tactical fighter contract was viewed as essential for its survival as a major combat aircraft manufacturer. There were real concerns within the Defense Department about preserving competition in the aerospace industry. If Lockheed lost, Northrop could emerge with a near monopoly on advanced stealth aircraft. But there was another factor, less visible yet deeply influential, so-called fighter mafia. This group of senior pilots and decision makers had come of age during the Vietnam War. Their combat experience was shaped by dogfights and maneuver-based engagements. To them, Thrust vectoring represented dominance in its purest form. The YF-22 aligned with how they believed air combat should be fought. The YF-23 did not. Its philosophy rejected traditional dogfighting entirely. It was designed to detect, engage, and destroy adversaries long before visual contact was ever established. Strike first. Remain invisible. Never allow the enemy a chance to respond. For many traditionalists, this approach felt wrong. It did not look like air combat as they understood it. Paul Metz later summarized the difference bluntly. Northrop built the better airplane. Lockheed sold the better story. The YF-22 entered service as the F-22 Raptor in 2005. It quickly earned a reputation as the most dominant air superiority fighter ever built. But production was capped at just 187 aircraft. Due to budget constraints and shifting strategic priorities, the Silver Bullet Force, America envisioned, never fully materialized. Meanwhile, the two YF-23 prototypes were quietly transferred to museums. One now rests at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. The other resides at the Western Museum of Flight in California. Beautiful, deadly, forgotten, or so it seemed. Time moved on, but the consequences of that 1991 decision did not fade. They waited fast forward to the present day. The F-22 Raptor fleet is aging. Of the 187 aircraft originally built, fewer than 186 remain operational. And availability continues to decline as maintenance demands increase. Each flight hour grows more expensive. Each airframe grows closer to the limits of its service life. The F-35 Lightning II has entered service in large numbers. But it was never designed to replace the F-22's pure air superiority role. It is a multi role platform optimized for strike, intelligence gathering, and networked warfare. Powerful, yes, but different. And while America debated budgets and priorities, its adversaries did not stand still. China unveiled the J-20 stealth fighter in 2011. 
Russia followed with the Su-57, both programs incorporated low-observable shaping, advanced sensors, and long-range missiles specifically designed to challenge. American dominance in the air, neither aircraft matched the F-212 outright, but the gap was narrowing. At the same time, America's production lines for air superiority fighters were silent. No new Raptors, no direct successor. This is where the YF-23's warning begins to echo the air. Force now finds itself racing to develop Next Generation Air Dominance, or NGAD, a sixth-generation solution to an increasingly complex threat environment. But NJAC faces familiar problems, escalating costs, political scrutiny, debates over quantity versus capability, history is repeating itself. The Air Force selected the YF-22 in 1991. Fourteen years passed before it entered operational service. By the time the program matured, production was already being curtailed. The cost per aircraft exceeded $150 million. And now, barely two decades later, the fleet requires replacement. The YF-23 represented a different philosophy. One focused on reach rather than theatrics, stealth rather than spectacle, strategic endurance rather than short-range dominance. Had it been selected, production may still have been limited. Budgets would still have tightened. Politics would still have intervened, but its extended range and reduced infrared. Signature may have fundamentally altered how American air power was projected across the Pacific. Today, defense analysts openly question whether the Air Force chose the right aircraft not because the F-22 failed, but because the nature of warfare changed in ways the YF-23 anticipated. Modern air combat is not about turning inside an opponent's loop, it is about sensor fusion, long-range missiles, first detection, first shot in that environment. Invisibility and reach matter more than thrust vectoring demonstrations. The warning is not about revisiting a 30-year-old competition, it is about recognizing a pattern, America repeatedly favors short-term visual superiority over long-term. Strategic advantage, defense acquisition rewards programs that perform well in hearings rather than those that quietly deliver enduring capability, the same questions now surround NGAD. Reports suggest unit costs could exceed $300 million per aircraft. At that price, how many will actually be built? 2030. Will America once again field a breathtakingly capable aircraft in numbers too small to shape global outcomes? The YF-23 stands as a reminder. Brilliance without commitment is meaningless. An aircraft cannot deter wars if it exists only in museums. Technology does not matter if it cannot be deployed at scale. And while America debates, China builds stealth fighters roll off production lines. Not perfect, but numerous dot capability at scale wins wars.